There is a little-known analogy between electromagnetism and gravity, which is derived from the fact that they are both vector field functions. James Clerk Maxwell was the first to derive the equations for the divergence and curl of the vector field. These equations became famously known as Maxwell's equations, which are the foundation of conventional electromagnetic theory. The delta operator, which is designated as an upside-down triangle, is called a gradient, which basically tells us the direction of greatest change in the vector field. The divergence tells us the amount by which it changes when we move in this direction. The divergence is designated by a gradient dot product operator with the, it's the upside-down triangle with the period next to it. And the curl gives us the axis of rotation of a paddle wheel if we were to place it in the vector field and see which direction it rotated. The curl is designated by the cross product, which is the x, uh, the delta operator with an, followed by an x. But now, just as electromagnetism breaks down into the electric field and magnetic field components, gravity can be broken down into gravitoelectric and gravitomagnetic components. The analogy is as follows. Magnetism is just a relativistically induced force caused by the movement of electric charge. Take a charge Q and move it through a space a distance D, and it will produce a magnetic field which curls around the loop of the wire in a corkscrew. The direction of the magnetic field is determined by using the right-hand rule, a very important tool in physics, and especially electromagnetism. If you run current through a wire, the motion of the electrons passing through the wire will produce a magnetic field around the wire. So take your right hand and point your thumb in the direction of the current, and as the electrons move in the direction of your thumb, they produce a magnetic field in the direction which your fingers curl. So if we take a coil of wire and trace the movement of the electrons passing through it using the right hand rule, we can see how the magnetic fields all add up to produce a single large magnetic field. This is how electromagnetics work. Just as, the presence, just as the presence of charge creates an electric field, the presence of mass produces a gravitoelectric field, which creates the gravity that keeps you and I grounded to this huge, giant chunk of space rock. So just as the motion of an electric charge through space produces a magnetic field, the motion of a mass through space creates a gravitomagnetic field. It is the very nature of gravitomagnetism, which our scientists are just beginning to understand. NASA's Gravity Probe B will likely give us some clues once the results come back later this year. I recommend you go to nasa.gov and read up on Gravity Probe B, even though NASA is basically just a PR-friendly cover-up for the government's real space programs. They still have a lot of legitimate scientists working for them, and their research is still legit, even though we all know what goes on inside, build, inside Building 8 of the Kennedy Space Center, thanks to Disclosure Project Witness Number 19. But anyways, the point of this video is to explain anti-gravity. We've already gone over the basics, and we know how to make an electromagnet. Now we need to figure out a way to make a gravitomagnet. But first, we need to talk about magnetic levitation. Scientists have experimentally shown that it is possible to levitate a frog using strong magnetic fields, but the fields need to be oscillating back and forth because a unidirectional field produces rotation which needs to be stabilized in order to keep the object balanced in one place. However, superconductors will levitate in a constant magnetic field due to the Meissner effect, which is a result of diamagnetism which is a form of magnetism that is only exhibited by a substance in the presence of an externally applied magnetic field. This is the same thing that lo levitates the frogs, diamagnetism. Superconductors and superfluids are both examples of Bose-Einstein condensates, which is kind of like a fifth state of matter. A superconductor conducts electricity with zero resistance, while a superfluid flows through a container with zero resistance. Friction is totally eliminated. A superfluid will pour straight through a ceramic container because it is porous. It will also flow through the tiniest hole instantly because all the atoms in a superfluid reduce to a single wave function, which obeys Bose-Einstein Bose statistics instead of fermionic statistics. The Pauli exclusion principle states that no two atoms, or fermions, or matter particles, can occupy the same space at the same time but the atoms in a Bose-Einstein condensate become bosons, or force particles, which do not obey the Pauli exclusion principle and can all fit through the tiniest hole at the same time. 
even if it's only one atom wide. As long as it's wide enough to let one through, they can all fit through at the same exact time because of this. A Russian scientist by the name of Eugene Podkletnov was doing superconductor research in a laboratory in Finland when he discovered a strange effect produced by rotating superconductors. It turns out that these rotating superconductors produced gravitomagnetic fields that were trillions of orders of magnitude larger than were previously predicted by quantum mechanics. I have a link to the Paul Klitnov paper, which he co-authored with Italian physicist Giovanni Maldanis, in the description. Similar studies were done in Vienna, Austria, by Martin Tajmar, who has a paper titled Gravito Magnetic Field of a Rotating Superconductor or Superfluid, and also in America by a Chinese-American physicist, Ning Li, and Douglas Tor of the University of Alabama. Ning Li was so thrilled with the results of her research and her discoveries that she started her own company, AC Gravity LTD, which immediately got a DOD contract, and no one has heard from her since. She's probably working at Area 51. Edgar Fouché holds degrees in aeronautical engineering and has all the scientific background to have worked at Area 51. In an interview on British television, he disclosed details of the Aurora project, which was to reverse engineer technology from crashed alien spacecraft. He described the anti-gravity drive of the TR-3B flying triangle, and I am actually going to post this video as a response to that video, because he confirms everything I just said and all the work of all the research I just cited. The mercury-based plasma he is referring to is a superfluid ferrofluid, which is supercooled to 150 degrees Kelvin, or the lambda point at which the fluid becomes a Bose-Einstein condensate. This allows the fluid to rotate around the container with zero friction, which means it never slows down. However, however there are problems with rotating a superfluid, because there is no friction rotating the container it is in does nothing, because you rotate the sides of the container, it just doesn't do anything because there's no friction force pushing the atoms around. So you can rotate the container, it won't rotate the fluid. You can also try to stir it in a circle, and but it only makes the atoms rotate on their individual axis. It doesn't make the fluid rotate as a whole. So this is why we need a ferrofluid, or a magnetic fluid, which will move in the presence of a magnetic field, thus allowing us to rotate the fluid using magnets, or electromagnets. The result is the superfluid antigravity centrifuge, which has no limit to how fast it can spin other than the centripetal force that holds the container together and prevents the sides from busting out as a result of the centrifugal force being exerted on the walls by the fluid inside. So, there you have it. There's all the scientific background on antigravity, um, and I can encourage I encourage everyone to do their own research. I am providing you with the sources and putting all the pieces together, but this isn't something that you learn and fully understand after watching a 10-minute YouTube video. It takes a PhD in physics, unless you're the next Richard Feynman. Disclosure Project witness Jonathan Wagen gives some details about the mercury-based plasma he witnessed at a crash site in Peru. I have links to that video in the description. And there's also some evidence to suggest that the Nazis were working on this Wunderwaffe technology, as the details of the so-called Bell experiment are consistent with everything we just talked about. Uh, I have links to all this stuff, again, in the descriptions. Um, I hope this helps answer some questions for people and uh, opens the doors to anti-gravity and space exploration, which would be awesome. It would be great if we could not have to build giant rockets that pollute and in order to blast things into space. It would be great if we could just have a little flying saucer disk type thing to fly into space. This also makes sense with and is consistent with the reports of flying saucers because their shape would be consistent with a, uh, a craft that would be rotating superfluid around the inside at a high speed. It uh, describes, basically explains why they're shaped like that and why they choose that um, design and that shape because of the engine that's inside of it. So, um, again, don't forget to rate five stars and subscri subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. There's plenty more to come.